Um, we really do thank you for joining us, despite the fact there's a, an amazing football game going on. And, uh, and uh, you know, welcome to the first installment of Masters of the Fly. And um, we thought just briefly, we talked a little bit about our philosophy, which is very much, but, you know, Masters of the Fly really has nothing to do with uh, being accomplished at your craft while it may help. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not the most important thing. Masters of Fly is really a community. Uh, who we, we all share the same desires and passions for fly fishing. It's kind of almost a spiritual calling, let's say it. Um, I know it sounds kind of zen, but as many of us know, just being out there very often is, is good enough. Um, the process, the passion, the love of the outdoors, that's really what brings this group together. Um, I'd like before we get to going to send out a special thanks to uh, Tom Kaczynski. Um, your technical assistance has been amazing and we really couldn't have pulled this off without you. So Tom, thank you very much. Um, Lou, let me throw this off to you now. Thanks, David. So uh, just very quickly, uh, you know, we started this um, series of events last year, actually before COVID, uh, because we were all going stir crazy on a normal winter. And then when COVID, ran, you know, came, came around, we realized there was an opportunity to get like-minded anglers together. And uh, when we're not fishing, actually do something meaningful. So we're super excited to have our friends from American Saltwater Guides Association here today. Big thank you to John McMurray. Many of you know John, obviously a, a, a very well-known legendary guide here in the Northeast. Uh, Willie Goldsmith, who is the executive director of ASCA. Uh, Tony Friedrich, who's uh, really been uh, the heart and the soul of the organization and, and, and a great buddy. Uh, and Peter Jenkins, uh, who's uh, the founding board chair and, uh, and proprietor of uh, Saltwater Edge. So uh, excited to, to have you guys uh, 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 talk with us. Um, on the screen behind uh, David and me, you'll see the upcoming events. Um, uh, if you go to the URL there, the mastersofthefly.com slash events, uh, you can register for those events. Super excited uh, about the, ne the next few events. We've got um, four great tying events uh, with David Blinken uh, doing one, Johnny King, who's the inventor of the Kinky Muddler, uh, Ken Eklund, who's uh, one of the Masters of the Fly, uh, Tony himself is doing a session. Before that, uh, February 15th, we have an, a great session with Jamie Howard from Howard Films. If any of you haven't seen Running the Coast or Chasing Silver or Location X, I mean, he's really kind of invented the whole genre of fly fishing movies. Uh, and then we end it in May, on May 2nd, with James, the legendary artist, naturalist, writer, James Prozac, uh, who wrote uh, Trout, um, uh, in which uh, sort of uh, collected 70 incredible uh, watercolors of trout from around the United States. So. Really hope everyone can join us for those events. We'll leave the, the link up on the screen for any of you who want to register. Uh, and then um, uh, I want to also just uh, turn this over to Eric Schatzker, who is, be, besides being a, another master of the fly and really one of my very best friends, um, <clears throat> is an incredibly um, well-known and accomplished uh, editor-at-large at Bloomberg um, news and we'll be doing a lot of the uh, uh, Q&A and moderation for the sessions starting tonight and going into the future. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to do was to say a big thank you uh, to Tom again, but also to the other folks on the Masters of the Fly planning committee who put in a ton of work uh, to make this uh, a reality. Yeah, we um, applaud you guys. Thank you for your help. It was uh, just incredible. So with that, uh, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. Luyen, thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. I am Eric Schatzker, as Luyen just said, I fish NYC on Instagram. Uh, when Luyen and David told me that they wanted to host a series of virtual events to build a fly fishing community, I said, sign me up. I mean, tell me what I can do to help because I see this Masters of the Fly not just as an opportunity to make us all better at catching fish, something we think about all the time, but also better at understanding and conserving the environment that we exploit catching fish, doing what we love. Now, few people uh, live that credo as much as the three people whom uh, Luyen briefly mentioned and whom I'm going to introduce in a bit more detail. Together, of course, they do run the American Saltwater Guides Association, also known as ASGA. You can see them here on your screen. Captain John McMurray is a professional guide and the owner operator of One More Cast Charters here in New York City. 
He's a dedicated conservationist. He sits on the Striped Bass Advisory Panel of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. I'm sure many of you online with us tonight have had the pleasure of being expertly guided by John. Uh, Tony Friedrich is a lifelong advocate for marine conservation with more than 20 years of experience at the local, state, and federal levels, including almost a decade as executive director of the Coastal Conservation Association of Maryland. And Willie Goldsmith is executive director of ASGA. He's a Harvard biologist with a PhD in marine science. And naturally, he's an obsessive fisherman. Um, it wasn't until I got to know John that I came to realize what's really at stake out there in the ocean. You're going to hear about that tonight. And I hope leave inspired to do what you can do to make a difference. Here's how things are going to go for the next 50 minutes or so. John is going to give us what I think of as the state of the striped bass for about 10 to 12 minutes. And then we're gonna open it up to Q and A for all of you, a moderated Q and A session with John, with Tony and with Willie Everything's going to be on the table, not just stripers, but blues, albies, tuna, whatever you like. They're the experts. You can ask them questions. Please use the Q&A box on your screen to submit your questions. And please don't be shy. The more you participate, the better this is going to be. We're not naming names. Everything's anonymous. And I'm going to do my best to get to everybody's questions. And so without further ado, John McMurray, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Let me share my screen. Um, where to go? Hmm. I'm not showing up there, John. Just trying to find it. All of a sudden, it's gone. Let me try again. Sorry, guys. No problem. You see that share screen link on the bottom? I do. I'm just the uh, PowerPoint is not showing up. Hold okay. on, let me close out some stuff. Sorry, guys. No worries. No, nope. we got you covered, John. Okay, there it is. We got it, John. What's up? Great. Yep, disappeared there for a minute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric. Let's get this thing going here. Um, my name is John McMurray, and we are going to talk about the state of the striper, but specifically uh, where we are now and, and how we got here. Um, but before we do that, uh, just some, some context about uh, what I do and, and what I've done, because I, I think it's important in the context of some of the points I'm going to make. And, and I have kind of a unique perspective as a guide and uh, as, as a manager. Um, so I run one more cast charters. I've run striped bass trips for about 20 years, um, become a little bit more well known for the tuna stuff, but make no mistake, uh, my spring and fall is all striped bass fishing. And and that transition to tuna kind of had to do with uh, the downturn in striped bass and, and the lack of availability in the summer. Um, so to survive, I had to kind of switch things over and diversify a little bit. So uh, in addition to owning and operating that business, I did three terms in the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. And that is one of the federal uh, management councils. And they don't manage striped bass, they manage bluefish, scup, uh, black sea bass, summer flounder, uh, squid, mackerel, butterfish, and a few other things. Um, but there's very big difference between federally managed fish and state managed fish, and I'll get to that uh, towards the end. Um, so for the last four years, I've been the legislative proxy for, uh, for New York on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And that is the coalition of states that, that manage everything within three miles that manage state waters. Um, and they manage striped bass in particular. So we're gonna talk about uh, some things that went down at the commission um, in the last 10 years and, and how we ended up where we are. Um, I'm also the president of the American Saltwater Guides Association. Uh, and we started this a little over two years ago. And the idea behind uh, the association was to try to give the light tackle guides more of a voice uh, 
and and more of a uh, representation at the uh, at the management level. And uh, the reason for that was um, everything kind of uh, boils down to jobs um, and and economic impacts uh, in the council and commission decision making process. And they kind of looked at the recreational fishery as, uh, you know, not irrelevant, but, but as a bunch of rich guys playing with their fish and trying to take them away from the hardworking uh, commercial guys and the uh, party and charter boat captains. Um, but our point now is that, well, you know, we're hardworking guys too. We're kind of hand to mouth and, uh, you know, most of us aren't well to do and, and we work really hard and, uh, and we need uh, fish in the water to be successful. And, and we're part of the industry that benefits from conservation and, and long-term sustainability. And that was a voice that surprisingly was not being communicated up until very recently. So uh, where are we with striped bass now? The stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Now the difference between those two terms is very simple. Uh, overfished is a reference point. It's uh, a spawning stock biomass, a number of spawning fish in the water or actually pounds of spawning fish in the water that scientists uh, are able to determine uh, or, or that qualifies as a healthy stock. Now overfishing occurs when you are fishing at a level that depletes the stock and doesn't allow you to get to that spawning stock biomass level. So uh, we are currently at 75% of the threshold um, 75% of what constitutes a healthy stock. And it's important to point out that 90% of the mortality is, is from recreational fishing. Now, this determination was made in 2018. It was no real surprise to folks who spend a lot of time in the water. Um, I guess right around 2012, we all started to, to see a very discernible decline in availability. Uh, we lost those things like those epic Montauk bass blitzes. Uh, the flats fishery in particular kind of wasn't what it was. And I wouldn't describe the fishing as terrible. It just wasn't as good as it once was. And we kind of lost that consistency that a lot of us built our businesses on. So uh, why did this happen? Well, um, this is the Maryland uh, Juvenile Striped Bass Abundance Index. And it's a SANE survey and it's been happening all the way since uh, 1954. Now, we all probably know that striped bass are anadromous, meaning that they spawn in freshwater and spend their lives in saltwater. And uh, the biggest estuary along the East Coast is, of course, the Chesapeake Bay. And so, uh, according to the best available science, about 80% of the coastal stock originates in the Chesapeake Bay. So, when you look at this chart, I don't know if you guys know, yeah, there it is. Um, we're all probably more or less uh, aware that striped bass almost crashed, almost completely collapsed uh, from probably the mid 70s all the way into the late 80s, uh, early 90s. Uh, they were in really bad shape. And uh, through some really definitive management action, I won't get into the history, uh, the states kind of decided that they were going to really clamp down on harvest to address uh, what they called uh, recruitment overfishing. That's kind of a fancy term and I'm, I'm gonna simplify it greatly and I'm sure Willie's gonna roll his eyes, but it's really uh, addressing killing fish before they spawn. Um, and it's a pretty simple concept, but they finally addressed it. And it took a, a tremendous amount of, of political effort to do that because just like now, uh, there were stakeholders who were saying, well, are you gonna put us out of business? It's not us, it's the environmental conditions. Uh, it's pollution in the Chesapeake, but guess what? They addressed uh, recruitment overfishing, and, and in some states, there was moratorium. In other states, they went to a 36-inch limit, which allowed all fish to spawn at least once, and guess what? The stock responded, and it responded incredibly, uh, and you look at the years um, starting in, in uh, the early 90s, and you have all these tremendous uh, young of the year indices, all these really big spawns that happened in the Chesapeake, and this thing, this chart is incredibly accurate at forecasting what the fishery is gonna look like seven, eight years out when those fish recruit into the coastal stock. Um, so uh, all the way up until 2003, we had this big boom of fish. And then all of a sudden uh, after 2003, those young of the year indices started to decline. Uh, 
they don't look terrible. And when you compare them to when the stock almost collapsed in the 80s, uh, you know, they don't look that bad, but there's certainly a, a decline there. And I, I want to point something out here. And you, you look at uh, the young of the year indices, particularly uh, 2011 and 2015, they were two pretty good years. And they weren't bad after that. You know, we had a couple that were above, uh, above average. And then you look at, look at how bad it was back then when we really needed that moratorium. So uh, I don't like it when people say, oh, we need another moratorium because I don't think we're there yet. Uh, and I think we could certainly avoid that. Uh, if the commission makes good decisions moving forward. Okay, so uh, management actions. Um, there were uh, there were a lot of warning signs uh, at the commission that, and they really could have avoided this overfishing situation that we're in. And the first was a 2011 assessment update. Uh, it showed we were overfishing, uh, but we were well below the spawning stock biomass target. Um, and or we were well over the, the threshold. So there really was no uh, need for management action, but the commission certainly could have taken that action. They saw uh, the stock going down and they understood that we didn't have these super strong young of the year uh, indices that we had uh, before, but they kept harvest high anyway. And part of the reason that they did, well, let me get into the two 2013 benchmark. Well. Part of the reason they didn't take action uh, with that 2011 update is because we had that extraordinary 2011 year class, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, we had a 2013 benchmark and again, overfishing was occurring and we were well below that uh, spawning stock biomass target. And to uh, the commission's credit, they did take action. It took them an, an entire year actually two years of kind of arguing about it for one year and then actually initiating uh, addendum four. And uh, they did get addendum four done and it required a 25% reduction in landings. And uh, that what that the coastal limit went from two fish to one fish. And uh, the coast actually performed really well and most of the coastal states were 40 plus percent uh, in reductions. Uh, where that really failed was in Maryland. Um, and the reason it failed is because of something called conservation equivalency. And that's baked into the management plan. And it gives the states the ability to develop uh, conservationally equivalent regulations. So as long as they look good on paper, uh, and as long as the rest of the commission approved them, they could do their own regulations. Um, so they failed miserably in Maryland and they went over their baseline by I think 58%. Uh, in the end, it was like 150% overage. And arguably uh, that kind of wiped out all those, those 2011s, those really good uh, uh, young of the year that the commission was kind of counting on to recruit into the coastal stock. Um, so fast forward to 2018, we get another benchmark assessment and guess what? Uh, not only is the stock, and not only are we overfishing, but we've now uh, reached an overfish level and we're 75% uh, of where we're supposed to be. Okay, so um, give me a second here. So the 2018 benchmark assessment, um, uh, it, 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 gave the staff um, something to act on. Um, the staff came back and said, well, to address overfishing, we need to reduce uh, fishing effort by 18%. We need to reduce landings by 18%. Um, and they gave us a suite of options to do that. And as a result, we initiated uh, um, addendum seven or addendum six. And uh, they gave us a suite of options to address that uh, 18% reduction. And uh, in the end, what they picked was a 28 to 35 inch slot limit. And uh, we didn't really like that um, because, uh, you know, it seemed to make more sense to us to do what we did last time we brought the stock back, which is just to create a, a 35 inch size limit, size limit that will allow every fish to spawn once. Um, but there was a lot of discussion around the table about discard mortality. And, and it was kind of a red herring um, because discard mortality is 
you know, those, those are the fish that die when you release them. They're always going to be relatively constant no matter what, but they thought by allowing people to kill smaller fish, then it would reduce some of the discards. Um, and also some of the party boat guys did their usual thing and said they were going to go out of business if you didn't let them kill a 28 inch fish. Um, and they also required circle hooks. And, and I want to point out that there was really, they really didn't address a rebuilding plan and, and the fishery management plan requires uh, that if you're, if you become overfished, if you go under that spawning stock biomass threshold, then you had to rebuild the stock within 10 years. They didn't really take in, take in, into account that at all. They just wanted to address uh, fishing mortality. So uh, where are we now? Well, um, just judging by the radio chatter this year, and it's, it's anecdotal, uh, but everybody was complaining about not being able to find and kill a slot fish. Everybody was like, where are these slot fish? We can't find them. Um, my business in particular released a crap ton of really big fish. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we don't really have any indication because uh, the recreational fishing data wasn't really available this year because of, of COVID. Uh, but I think a lot of big breeders were released and were saved because of this. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see uh, what the data shows us. But I, I know it just seems like a lot of a lot less fish were killed this year. Uh, a lot less of those kind of big dead fish on the dock photos on, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you know, I, I suspect we'll see an increase in, in discard mortality because, uh, you know, all those releases occurred. Um, and, and certainly some of these fish didn't survive after you release them. But uh, in my experience, um, I don't think that is a relevant number. I mean, I know all these big fish that we caught, we released them, they swam away, they seem very strong. Um, so I do think uh, this did a lot of good, this, this action with uh, addendum, uh, addendum six did, did a lot of good. So uh, what else do we see this year? Well, for the past few years, there's been a lot of schoolies around. I mean, a lot. You had those blitzes start to come back in Montauk. Um, Jamaica Bay was full of these fish, these kind of uh, 20 to 26 inch fish. And those are getting released too. So I think a lot of the stock is, is being protected right now. Now, um, the problem with these fish is that they are likely gonna recruit into the fishery next year, meaning recruit into the uh, catch and kill fishery. They're probably gonna be over that 28 inch limit. They're probably gonna uh, be in that slot size. And I think they're probably gonna get hammered. Um, so this, you know, it's, it's hard to argue that we didn't have better fishing this year. And it was a little better last year too. Um, but I, it's very possible that it might be temporary after these, uh, these 2000, these 26 inch fish uh, start getting hammered next year. And, and presumably, I don't think I mentioned it. These are the 2015s. These are theoretically that really big year class that I, sh I showed you on the uh, uh, young of the year industry chart. Um, so, um, what's next? Um, Amendment seven. So, uh, during once we completed the last addendum that required this 18% reduction, Maryland kind of uh, flagged, you know, that maybe maybe these goals we were setting for striped bass were too high, and maybe we couldn't get them back to to the levels that they were in '96 when we had rebuilt the stock, and maybe the Chesapeake Bay is not as productive as it once was. Uh, and so they, they started talking about doing a new addendum, uh, a, a new amendment to totally relook at how we manage striped bass. And uh, their goal really, uh, if you try to, if you read between the lines, is that they wanted to tweak those reference points. Um, in other words, your, your spawning stock biomass and your fishing mortality reference points, they wanted to kind of lower the spawning stock biomass reference point uh, and basically uh, move the goalposts on what a healthy stock looked like. And their, uh, their motivation is pretty clear. I, I think they wanna uh, liberalize regulations for their charter fishing industry and their commercial fishing industry, even when the stock is clearly overfished and overfishing is occurring. So uh, it's a two-year process. We actually initiated the amendment in August. Um, 
and, and to be clear, we haven't done a full amendment since 2003, and this is a, a really big undertaking. And with this amendment, we could totally change the way we manage this fishery. Um, one of the things to look at in the development of this amendment, and, and just to tell you where we are, we have a, a draft public information document, which is a draft of, of the actual amendment. And uh, we already went over it once at the board level and the commission, and we made some edits. And we're gonna go through the, that last round of edits at the meeting in two weeks, and then it's gonna go out to the public and there's gonna be a public comment period. But what's at stake here, the fishery goals and objectives, uh, the last amendment, amendment six, uh, it, it actually, the, the goals and objectives are very good um, and they're, they're fairly conservative and, and they emphasize uh, maintaining uh, availability along the coast and they emphasize maintaining uh, a, a good age and size structure. So there's, so you're not kind of hedging on one year class like you kind of did with 2011. Um, and so they want to tweak those and, and they could really kind of shift the emphasis away from coastal availability to harvest. Um, so we really have to be vocal on this, on that part of it. Um, we're also going to address stock rebuilding and, and the time frame for doing it. And of course, uh, Maryland seems to want to extend that time frame. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to make sure we actually rebuild the stock within 10 years. Uh, because they're not doing that now. Um, management triggers are just the, uh, the triggers for management action. Like if the stock uh, reaches a certain uh, point below the threshold or above the uh, fishing mortality threshold, then you have to take management actions. But what's really critical here, uh, as I mentioned, is the biological reference points. And um, if, if some states can develop the science that shows us that maybe these reference points that we have are not reachable or are not easy to reach or are not reasonable, uh, then they're gonna end up moving that goalpost back. Um, I won't get into regional management, but that's relevant too. Uh, the, the discard mortality thing drives me nuts because uh, they wanna address it, but, but it's not gonna go away. Any fishery where you have 90% of the fish being released, it's primarily a sport fishery, is gonna have that discard mortality. So I'm not sure what they think they're gonna do about it, but they're kind of using it as a way to shift emphasis off the harvest part and, and onto the, the folks who are releasing them. Uh, the, the bright spot here is that uh, we have a chance to kind of tweak the conservation equivalency program. I know a lot of folks wanna get rid of it altogether. And again, that uh, gives the states the ability to develop uh, conservation equivalent regulations on paper anyway, but they usually don't work on the water as we saw with Maryland. Um, and we really, there should be some accountability with that program. Like if your regulations don't work, then guess what? You better change them right away. And, and some folks even think you should pay back those overages that you had as a result of the conservation equivalency. Uh, so there's a really good uh, opportunity to change that there. Um, also, there's gonna be a discussion of uh, commercial quota allocation and um, you know the recreational versus commercial allocation. Um, not going to get into that there, but I, I, the ones I have highlighted here are really the, uh, the important ones. And uh, this is going to go out to the public after we have a final uh, PID uh, public information document. And it's really important that the public comment on this. And uh, it's really important that uh, we show up, that we, we show up and we, we make our voices well known. Let me tell you why. Um, because federal management and state management is very different. Uh, with federal management, you have these mandates. You have to address overfishing within two years and you have to rebuild with, within 10 years. And there are annual catch limits to ensure that happens and there are accountability measures. So if you don't do it, guess what? You have to do a pound per, per, per pound payback if that stock is overfished. Um, now the states and the commission don't have any of those requirements. There's no mandates. I mean, they say they wanna do it in their amendments um, and, but there's nobody there to sue them if they don't do it because there's no mandates. There's nothing illegal about them disregarding their own management plans. Um, so what it comes down to at the commission uh, in contrast to the council is politics. It's who shows up, it's who makes those, those efforts and, and who goes to the meetings, 
who, uh, not just grassroots, but grass tops, who's meeting with their legislators, who's meeting with their commissioners. Um, and, and that's kind of where the Guides Association, uh, and we've only been around for two years, has really been able to turn the needle um, because we are, uh, you know, a, a relevant economic, uh, economically relevant stakeholder. And we have been making those connections and we have been showing up. And, and let me be clear, for the past three decades, the pro-harvest folks have been way better than us at doing that, way better. And they are the ones that kind of get all the attention. Um, even though they're, minor they're the minority, even though they're, they're not the primary stakeholder, even though the public is, and who absolutely wants this fishery to be managed uh, for abundance, for sustainability, for, for access, um, it's still the pro-harvest guys that get most of the ink. Um, hey John, we've got a yeah. bunch of questions starting to roll in. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm pretty much wrapping up here, um, but it's an important that we weigh in on this and, and you know, make sure that you guys uh, sign up for our newsletter. It'll give you, uh, you know, you'll get actionable items. You'll get, uh, you'll know when and where these hearings are going to be, and it gives you the opportunity to engage. And that's it. Thank you. John, that was a great presentation. And as I suspected, uh, drew a number of questions. Folks, I'm gonna to get to the ones that we have already. I encourage you to keep popping them in. Uh, John and Tony and, and Willie are gonna answer them for you. As I suspected, John, the, uh, the point that you made that, that kind of alarmed everybody right off the top was this statistic um, that 90% of mortality is recreational fishing. And there's also a term that came up, discard mortality, and then overfishing in general. So I think let's try, if, if you don't mind, the three of you, and, and maybe Willie, you wanna kick this off, uh, given that, that you've got the doctorate. Um, who's killing all the fish? Is it the commercial guys who have uh, a legal harvest? Is it the recreational guys who are dropping fish, you know, from a deck 25 feet up, who, who, who is responsible here? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Eric. And I think the, uh, the short answer is, as John said, you know, the recreational sector. Um, you know, so he said 90% of mortality. That doesn't mean 90% of fish that are harvested. That's a combination of the number of fish that are being harvested by the recreational sector and the percentage of fish that are being released that are dying. Now, the most current, there hasn't been uh, really a, a comprehensive benchmark study on discard mortality in striped bass in over 25 years. Um, that study uh, is from Massachusetts uh, from I think 1995. And basically it found an estimated discard mortality of 9%. And so that doesn't sound like a huge number, but when you think about the number of striped bass that are caught each year, it's around, I think around 30 million fish being released each year. There are a lot of fish that people catch that get thrown back. And so when you aggregate that across millions of anglers and everything else, you end up having a pretty big impact. And so where we stand right now is, you know, 90% of, of mortality of all fish deaths come from the rec sector. About half of those are from fish that are actually harvested and taken home. And the other half is the 9% of all of those fish that are released. So hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity. You know, the commercial sector, um, you know, there certainly might be issues on a, on a state by state basis, but, you know, generally speaking, um, that, you know, that, that industry is, is far more accountable. You know, it's far fewer people who are fishing and harvesting fish and selling them compared to, again, um, you know, there were 16 million striped bass trips taken by anglers in 2018. There's just a huge amount of effort. Um, NOAA Fisheries does the best they can to, you know, to, to assess the number of trips, but it can be really difficult to, uh, to, you know, to keep a finger on the pulse of that fishery, uh, like can be done with the commercial fishery. So hopefully that helps clarify it a bit. I think so. There's a couple of other questions that I should get to on that topic. Uh, one of them is simply about, well, I think they've, they both actually could be described as best practices uh, besides or mandating circle hooks, which is goes in, that mandate goes into effect this year. Uh, what else, uh, you know, can the angler do to reduce that th those shocking mortality statistics? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. You know, this is where you get into that kind of squishy area, Eric, between, 
regulations and kind of, you know, what you would call like soft harnessing or social norms or trying to get people to do the right thing, right? So when it comes to what can we actually do in terms of gear requirements, you know, the, our, our toolbox is pretty limited. So this the circle hook effort is part of that, right? So the idea being that if more folks are using circle hooks with natural bait, they'll deep hook less fish and they'll have a, a lower post-release mortality. Uh, there actually isn't a huge amount of like great science on that. And the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries is actually in the process right now of doing a study to address that very question. So we'll hopefully be getting some, some more updated information on, on post-release mortality numbers with that. Um, when it comes to other things that anglers can do, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's less regulatory and it's more about, you know, it's really an, it's an outreach effort from the recreational fishing community. So many folks might have heard of like keep them wet or keep fish wet. Uh, who advocate for a number of, you know, different best practices, you know, keeping fish in the water or even just keeping fish, you know, wet, like as the name implies, is really important, you know, not having a fish bang around in the deck, as you said, um, you know, revival, you know, revival tactics. So if a fish is ready to kick off and let go, like, you know, and ready to go, like you don't need to, you know, you don't need to do any revival. Um, you know, there, there are kind of, there are, uh, there are a number of kind of small things that folks can do to, um, to help mitigate post-release, um, mortality. And I'd encourage individuals who are interested to, to check out Keep Fish Wet to get some more guidance on that, which is pretty general. Um, but hopefully coming out of this Massachusetts study, we'll have some more concrete guidance for striped bass in particular. John or Tony, you want to add anything to that on the subject of, uh, you know, mortality, discard mortality? Um, over, Look, you know, <laughs> you're all out there on the water. Tony, I see your hand go up. Jump yeah, in. yeah. Um, so the behavior of striped bass fishermen has changed over time. Uh, it's kind of funny to say this, but last century, uh, people preferred to kill striped bass and take them home, harvest them. Uh, as, as time went on, uh, a catch and release mentality uh, just kind of caught. People wanted to throw them back rather than keep them. And I'm talking about trends. I'm not talking about everyone. Uh, and now... I believe it's over 90% of striped bass are released that are caught. So as you have more people choosing to release, catch and release mortality is just a variable. It's nine, it, it, it's nine percent. So when Noah gets the number of how many fish they estimate recreational anglers catch, they multiply nine percent by that number, and that's how many that they figured died from a release mortality. And this is for everything. It's for people who use, you know, snag and drop. It's for guys who use single flies. It's for surf fishermen who throw plugs. It's for surf fishermen who throw bait. Across the board, 9% mortality. And if you think about it, the way some people treat them, that's really probably not that bad of an estimate, but better science is on the way. Um, so as people choose to release more fish, that number is just going to rise. It's the math. When 9% is applied to how many fish are, are released and more people are releasing fish, ergo, the number goes up. So as people choose to harvest less, release more, it's the people now, now there's now the folks who want to harvest more are saying, oh my gosh, we got so many problems. The release, the release mortality is above the harvest mortality. You're like, oh my God, what are people doing? I'm like punching them in the stomach before they let them go. No. <laughs> As a group of fishermen, we're choosing to let more fish go than we did 30 years ago. So I, I think people need to understand that about the math behind release mortality. The more fish we release, that number's gonna go up. John? John, there's a, there's a question here, John, that addresses a point that you made in your presentation about how, you know, you pointed out there are a lot of schoolies out there. You know, I saw the blitzes in Montauk, but they were 24 inch fish. For the most part, um, you mentioned, you know, how many 20 to 26 inch fish there were in the Jamaica Bay area. Uh, the question has to do with what the prognosis is for the spring, and you touched on it. Does it look like this is going to be an epic year, effectively, for that keeper slot, but with sort of big question marks about 22 and 23 and 24? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would have to say that those fish are going to show up again, and they're all going to be 27 and a half to 30 inches. Um, and you know, they're going to get hammered. I think, um, I, I can't really speculate on what that's going to mean moving forward. I mean, this is a pretty big group of fish. It may very well be able to 
to sustain that kind of harvest. It may not. Um, I think if the year classes, the year classes behind it were vastly smaller, right? Uh, yeah, and the the year classes on the other side are vastly smaller too. How long does it take to rebuild the stock? Uh, well, with a that's Pro properly properly managed. Yeah, well, that's that we should be able to rebuild it within ten years. Um, but when you look at uh, a species like striped bass, which is fairly long lived and slow growing, um, you know, it's it, it's more of a technical question for Willie. But it's if you, you know, put real regulations in place that would make sure everything spawns at least once, you could rebuild it pretty damn quickly. Did you want to add anything, Willie? Yeah, I just want to jump in and just mention, you know, we had talked about, you know, the juvenile abundance indices and recruitment and just, you know, wanted to be clear that how many, you know, unless, you know, what we saw in the 80s was that there was very, very low numbers of juveniles and that's because the stock was so low. Um, when you get to a place when the stock is even in a healthy, in a healthy level, um, you're going to have years of bad recruitment and that has nothing to do with how many fish there are or, you know, how many spawn. It has to do with environmental conditions. And that's one of the things that makes striped bass management really challenging. Um, you know, things like uh, temperature, water temperature, amount of rainfall that year, those can really dramatically implement how many baby stripers come out of a, of a given spring. And so, you know, while we can't necessarily control how many small fish there are going to be in a given year, what we can control is what we do when we have those good year classes. So if you have, you know, a really strong year class like in 2015, it's really important to, to, to get as many of those fish to spawning age as possible because you don't know when the next good year is going to come. Um, and so just kind of wanted to highlight that as, you know, one of the reasons why we keep talking about these, these important year classes, because it's one of the things that is within our control as, as managers to, to, uh, to have an impact. Before I move on to a whole other group of questions, Tony, a quick follow-up for you here. Uh, John pointed out or made the point that, uh, that, that Maryland, you know, you know, bears some responsibility for the problems that the fishery is enduring at the moment. Could you give everybody a sense of who the good guys are, like the heroes and villains? Who are the good guys here, and who are the bad guys? Oh, uh, Lord. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that burden on your shoulders. Uh, I, I will. I will tell you that it seems like the northern, the the northeast states. You have to look at this in the lens of who's on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, right? And um, and I think the states that are really conservation minded are the northern states. Um, Massachusetts, certainly, uh, Maine, New Hampshire. And then, you know, as you, as you kind of work your way down south, it kind of, the mentality starts to shift a little bit. So um, I think the big thing here is, you know, from New York North, uh, anyone listening on here has to do everything they can to contact their commissioners and make sure that they stay strong under pressure to be conservation minded because you know every state gets a vote so um so even if you know a couple of states down south are going to be putting the hammer down to harvest more fish you know you live in new york you can still do something about it by letting your commissioners know how important stripers are to you so you're actually addressing a point that comes up in a question which is what does asga need from all of us how do we, you know, how do we know? Is there sort of a, a how-to on the ASGO website about how to get in touch with the commissioner and make that case? So is Eric, there something else specifically, perhaps besides some fundraising dollars that you guys need from the people who are online listening and watching right now? Yeah, thank, thank you so much for that question. And thank you for whoever wrote it. Um, right now, the most important thing to the Guides Association is Stripe Bass. Um, that's, that's what we're hyper-focused on. And this public information document that John addressed in his presentation is most likely going to go out on February 3rd. That's when the meeting is soon after that. That's when people need to go to our website. Me, Willie, John will sit down. We'll review the document. We'll write our uh, association recommendations, maybe some cheat 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 for, uh, for regular rack anglers to where they can decipher the document and, and make their comments. So really, it's just around the corner. I mean, today's the 24th, meeting's on the 3rd, and then we're going to be in high gear on making sure those comments get in to make a difference. John, you, anything I left out there, buddy? No, nah, man, you covered it. Uh, John, you, you talked about conservation equivalency. Can, you know, can you give us a little bit more of an explainer on that? Just how far out of step are some of the states that Tony just referenced with 
perhaps the other states that are, are more conservation minded and more conservative about the way that they're managing the striper stuff. Yeah, and, and to Tony's point about the northern states being more conservation minded, I mean, it's not out of the goodness of their hearts, but, but they suffer from the lack of availability, whereas the southern states don't because they're, that's the center of, of where they come out of the Chesapeake there. Um, but how far apart are the states? Like, how far apart is Massachusetts from Maryland or New Jersey and Rhode Island? Or they're they're always way way far apart. Um, and and you know your your question about conservation of potency, it's it's very clear that there are a handful of states. Well, really, only two states that use it very clearly to try to liberalize their regulations as much as they can, so they could give their their anglers their, and their party charter fleet and their commercial industries as much fish as they can. And I, I won't be shy about pointing them out. One is New Jersey, one is Maryland. Um, Delaware is not great, um, but, but it's really, it's only a handful of states. And, and New York is not great either. It's, New York is usually the swing state. Now I'm a commissioner or I'm a legislative proxy for a commissioner, but it's three commissioners on, on, for each state. And if it's two against one, you know, nobody gives a crap about what I say. Um, so it's just reaching out to New York anglers. It's, it's Who are you up against? There's a question here about, uh, you know, the, the strength of, of the constituency, our constituency, meaning the conservation minded group of anglers. But, you know, when you say we kind of have a good idea of where you stand, who are you up against? Who, who are the other proxies and who do they represent? Uh, so there's an administrative commissioner, and that's uh, Jim Gilmore, who is the uh, head of the Bureau of Marine Resources for DEC. And then there's the governor's appointee, Emerson Hasbrook. And, um, you know, they're, they're good folks, but they receive a lot of pressure from the pro harvest people. So they often make decisions that are not in line with what most of the stakeholders in their state would want. And uh, part of the issue, and, and I, I tried to, to touch on it in my presentation, and maybe I didn't communicate it clearly, is that, uh, you know, they, they tend to look at the recreational fishing folks as, you know, a bunch of doofuses that play with their fish, rather than, you know, the hardworking guy that's trying to make a living. And I think that's where the Guides Association has, has turned the tide a little bit, because, you know, I'm ugly, and I got a great beard, and my hands are all disgusting and messed up and, and I'm busting my rear end to make a living and it's not just a bunch of guys you know throwing around fairy wands it's it's you know it's it's the the grassroots hard-working guy you know it's and that's come across I think uh it's come across in the last two years and I think it's going to continue to gain clout um uh, and 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 like I said those the other guys, the pro harvest guys, have shown up for thirty years, and we're just starting to show up now. So. Hmm. Uh, there are a couple of questions about what the right regulation at the moment should be. John, you said that you don't believe that the fishery has to return to a moratorium, um, but you also suggested that the twenty to thirty five inch slot limit isn't is far from ideal. Um, I'm not sure which one of you wants to jump in and answer the question, but, but help people out here to the degree that they want to wield influence or they just simply want to understand the biology better. What would, what would the right set of regulations for wreck anglers look like, so, Tony? Eric, the most right. successful that we ever were uh, was when we recovered the fish from the moratorium, right? So in 1985, uh, the AS ASMFC, the commission, the same commission that John sits on as a legislative proxy, um, they enacted a rule that would, in 1985, that would protect the 1982 year class because it was a decent year class and, and populations were in, in a terrible way, that it would protect that one year class as it matriculated through the system to where it had a 90, 95% chance of just spawning once to bring the stock back, right, to reach in spawning age. Within 10 years of enacting those regulations, um, you had basically a full recovery, our, our threshold level for striped bass population set, the whole world is a different place, which then led to the, for the next 
you know, 15 years, the best striped bass fishing any of us had ever seen. So the regulations are hard because you only get a good year class once every four to five years. So if I could wave my magic wand mm -hmm. and say, wave oh my it. gosh, I can change this tomorrow, which we can't. We have to work on this amendment. That's what's on the table. We can't pick anything different. But from a pure biology standpoint, we got a ton of 2015 fish in the water. If we could protect them until like they were 35 inches, that'd make a big difference in the long-term population structure of striped bass. So. Okay. Um, another natural question. Uh, John, I know you tried to, to get into it and didn't get into it deeply because it can be something of a rabbit hole, but uh, the, the question was written as follows. As a migratory species, shouldn't federal law govern striped bass in full? Um, why is this up to a bunch of warring states? And, and uh, I mean, without getting into a ton of history here, uh, is there any chance that, that striped bass become federally regulated? Um, no, and I think no. much, correct me if I'm wrong, Willie, but all anadromous fish are, are state managed. They're not federally managed. Um, and that's purely because it originate from the states. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they would look- if they, if they were pelagic, it would be a different, different story. If they were managed federally. For instance, uh, Maryland would have been held accountable for their overage. There likely would have been paybacks. Um, you know, they, we saw that, that overfishing was likely occurring back in 2011 there would have been uh, it, there would have been an annual catch limit that prevented it from happening next year. Um, it's just an entirely different management program. And Frank, after, John, after the stock assessment in 2017, accepted in 2018, we still don't have a rebuilding plan. Yeah, that's another thing. Bass. Would have, if that happened, have, if that happened to a federal fish, we should have been required to rebuild build. that in 10 years. There should have been regulations yeah. put in place the next year that would put the, the stock on track to rebuild, but it, it wasn't. And, and you know, that, frankly, that needs to change. I, I think the commission should be under the same standards as the federal councils should be. I, de I detect in some of the Q and A here, a little bit of frustration and I can understand why, because I'm, I'm making the assumption that a lot of people online are, are responsible anglers and even if they do a little grip and grin, they drop the fish back and revive it properly and let it go. And, um, you know, people are pointing to the, you know, the carnage that goes on in Raritan Bay in the spring, for example, and the, you know, the difference between the way that fish are handled, caught, handled, and released off of a charter boat than they are, say, off of, you know, a 20 foot boat with a, with a guide and an angler on it. Does it's it? I'm not sure it's it really amounts to a question, but does one of you want to address that? Well, I, I I'm not sure I want to comment on on different regions and, and different practices, but uh, just a, a comment on discard mortality in general. Like, you know, one in ten fish dies is not terrible. I mean, you think about every fish that goes in the cooler; they all die. Um, discard mortality is part of the fishery. It's not going to go away. 90% of them are released. As Tony's point, you know, it's the more that are released, the more discard mortality is going to go up. But, you know, what, what's the alternative? Uh, you want to reduce discards, then you increase harvest, and, and that makes fishing mortality go up exponentially. Um, the, the unfortunate part of this is that they're using that discard number to kind of shift focus away from harvest and and onto this other boogeyman. Um, mm -hmm. Look at all release fisheries in Florida, like bonefish or tarpon. They accept that discard mortality as part of the, the management peritogram. It's just part of the fishery and they should do so with striped bass also. It's, it's a total red herring. Um, the, the, the scary part of all this is that what they're, some folks are talking about behind the scenes is time and area closures, you know, shutting fishing down altogether at certain times of the year in certain areas. And, you know, that's, I don't think that's something that we're going to be able to accept. It's and, and putting the blame on us is, is not right. We're, we're really the responsible ones in this fishery, not the irresponsible ones. Anyway, Willie, go ahead. I'm sorry. I've talked too long. <laughs> no, I was just going to jump in and just say, you know, I think 
the platform is part of it, but more about, I think more, more relevant is the person doing the, you know, the person or the people doing the fishing. So somebody catching schoolies on the beach and it's, you know, the surf is rough and they're dragging all the fish up into the dry sand and taking a few pictures and throwing them back in, you know, what, you know, that sort of situation, you contrast that with, you know, that I think, you know, a high free board on a party boat, like if there's somebody who, you know, if, if there's a mate who's educated and who wants to, you know, release a fish and has a, has a big net and lifts the fish up and it's out of the water for 10 seconds and throws it back in, I think, you know, I think it, it, a lot of it depends on who's doing on who's doing the releasing. And so I think that's the point that, you know, yes, there are technical solutions, but there's also a big kind of human behavior component here too. So I think, you know, it's on us to reach folks across all those different sectors when it comes to pushing for the best, uh, the best ways to maximize survival. So, so there are things that we could do for sure to influence the general recreational fishing public to uh, increase survivability. Uh, but that 9% number is very unlikely to change even with this, this, uh, these circle hook requirements and these new uh, educational uh, um, priorities that the, the states are, are putting out. 9% um, is not terrible. I mean, we could talk all day about party boats versus small boats, but it's still going to be 9%. I mean, it's part of the fishery and it should be accepted as such. So, so just so everyone's clear, rebuilding the fishery requires what? Moving the slot limit or not even a slot. I mean, moving the minimum back up to 36 inches. Well, let, let me be the clear. Commercial that, harvest. There's a combination of measures. There's some speculation about, you know, those fish when they reach 28 inches, whether or not they, I mean, because it's a lot of fish. Maybe they can withstand the onslaught. Maybe they can't, but you know, if, if we really want to rebuild the stock and you take politics out of it, you set it at 36 inches and you, every single one of those fish spawns at least once. And I saw there was a question, I think Willie answered it about how many times a 28 inch fish spawns. Willie gave his, his weenie answer, but the truth is that uh, there is 50% um, of the of 28 inch fish spawn. Is that right, Willie? And a hundred, uh, 100% of 36 inch fish spawn at least yeah. once. So if you want to protect that fishery, you let them all spawn at least once. Simple as that. That's what- and that's, that's the regulation- the Last collapse. That them, that's the re just, that regulation that we brought them back with last time. Exactly. We just don't have the political clout to, to, to do that again. It just doesn't, it's going to have to get a lot worse before we do have that clout. Hey guys, I think uh, actually that is a great place to- formally uh, end this session. That said, uh, I don't know, John, Willie, Tony, others, if you're willing, Eric, to stay on any longer. We've obviously elicited a lot of interest in as you can see from the Q&A. Uh, uh, we will keep this open, but I thought, Eric, maybe just uh, worth sort of saying for anyone who uh, has a hard stop at nine o'clock to, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's watching the end of the AFC championship game or going to sleep or tucking kids in, uh, we really uh, appreciate your being here. I hope from the energy and the excitement and just the incredible information of this session, uh, you will be, um, you know, uh, excited about coming back for uh, some of our other sessions. Uh, before we, anyone drops off, I just want to say an enormous thank you to the ASCA folks, um, John, uh, Willie, Tony um, in particular, but also a huge thank to Eric, who um, I think um, just has been an incredible moderator here and has helped shape this conversation, and to all of you for your energy and your questions. Um, and with that, uh, I guess what I'd like to say is for anyone who wants to continue and who can, I recognize also some of our guests may not be able to go any uh, later, but uh, we'll keep going. But I just wanted to make sure, uh, you know, we, we, we ended the formal part of the session. And Lou Yen, while we still have people in case they do have to drop off, uh, Willie, perhaps you could just tell everybody where to go to get more information. There's yep. clearly an appetite for more people want to see the public information document and they want to know what to do. Tell them where they can find you. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, thanks for thanks for raising that, Eric. Uh, yeah, so our website is saltwaterguidesassociation.org. Uh, and if you go there, you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll be 
uh, definitely get spreading the word in early February when presumably the PID is going to be available for public comment. So that's the best way to kind of stay engaged on, you know, kind of the big ticket items that come out in our newsletter. Um, for kind of more regular communication, certainly we're, you know, pretty active on both Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, Saltwater Guides Association on Instagram and the American Saltwater Guides Association. On it's saltwaterguidesassociation.com or .org? I say they direct to the same spot. So whichever, they direct whichever to the same folks spot. would like Good. to write in. Yep. And if you do, if folks do have any questions for us, they can email us at info at saltwaterguidesassociation.org. If I know there were a bunch of questions that came in tonight. So um, if anybody has to run and didn't get their question answered, we're happy to field those, um, you know, offline. Yeah. Any other um, resources you would you direct them to online? If for people who really have an unquenchable thirst for information and, and, and a desire to take action? Yeah, I think um, a really good overview of striped bass and kind of where everything stands. I know that we've, you know, that, that we've been critical of, AS, of, you know, some actions of ASMFC um, recently, but they do do a really good job of providing context on, on the fisheries that they manage on their website. So if folks go to the ASMFC website and check out the striped bass species page, they, they give a pretty good overview. Of, uh, of where we are and where we've been and a lot of relevant documentation as well. Um, thank you very much, Willie. Um, again, I just want to throw out a huge thank you uh, to you, Willie, John McMurray, Tony, um, and Peter Jenkins as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Kaczynski, again, thank you so much for your help. And the planning team, you guys all know who you are. Thank you. And everybody who joined us tonight, and took time out of a busy football schedule. We really thank you. We cannot wait for you guys to join us for the next six events. And um, we're going to go on a little overtime now for those of you who want to ask a few more questions. Um, football game. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. we got uh, we got to can we talk tuna fish? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh. well, no, no, no. It it, it is it is. Uh, I I do want at the very least Willie uh, to take a couple of minutes and just tell everybody what's going on beyond the striper uh, fishery. What's happening with bluefish? A again, I, the the point here isn't to make this sort of dark and foreboding. Lots of progress has been made, and you might want to touch on some of that too. But where do we stand with stripers? Where do we stand with albies? Where do we stand with tuna? Yeah, so striped bass, I think we've, we've, we've pretty well beaten to death here in terms of where we are right now. Um, for bluefish, I actually, I think John is John is as informed or better than I am. Um, and it's, if folks checked out his blog on what uh, what decision was made um, at the Mid-Atlantic Council meeting a few weeks ago, that was, that was really informative too. And it also dovetails with a question about, you know, COVID-9 impacts on data collection. So John, I'm happy to take it, but if you, you know. Go ahead, go oh, for what it. a guy, thank you. Go ahead. Um, Somehow I saw that coming. So <laughs> bluefish are overfished. Um, I think many folks might be aware of that. Um, and we're in the midst of developing, develop, the Mid-Atlantic Council is in the midst of developing um, a bluefish reallocation and rebuilding plan. Uh, just to note By the on way, blue... sorry, are they federally regulated or is it state so regulated? That's, that, that's where I was going. So bluefish are regulated by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So um, they are subject to federal management. I'm sorry, uh, jointly managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and, and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So, um, you know, they are subject to the Madison-Stevens Act, which is our federal fisheries legislation. And basically um, with that, you know, the, it's required the stock rebuilt, be rebuilt as quickly as possible uh, in a time not to exceed 10 years, uh, that a rebuilding plan is in place within two years. Um, and that deadline is fast approaching, which is what is, again, is very different than striped bass. So basically where we stand right now is that um, bluefish are currently overfished. Um, there's this re, uh, there's this reallocation and rebuilding amendment that's in process right now. Um, I believe there's going to be a public hearing document. So not too dissimilar from what's going on with bluefish uh, with striped bass. There's going to be a um, an opportunity for public comment on bluefish coming up. Um, I believe in mid February, right after the council meeting. So that that again is going to be something that we're pretty active on. Um, one big issue that came up during the um, during the most recent meeting was what regulations are going to be for 2000, um, for 2021, uh, because basically 2020 was a, was a weird year, as we all know, and it, it impacted a lot of things, including fishery data collection. Um, mm. So there's a program many folks are familiar with. It's called MREP, Marine Recreational Information Program, that collects information on effort, so how much people are going fishing, and also basically how many, how many fish people are catching. 
Um, the first part, the effort part is based on mail surveys and those weren't interrupted, but the dockside intercept surveys that are used for estimating catch and harvest were impacted. So there's a fair amount of kind of interpolation that's gonna have to go on in terms of estimating what the harvest is gonna be. And there's not really gonna be, we're never really gonna have a great amount of certainty in terms of what happened in, um, in 2020. So when it came to setting bluefish regulations for 2021, um, there was a fair amount of back and forth um, because there were new regulations put in in 2020 to try to re you know, reduce harvest as a re result of the stock being overfished. And the decision was made to just roll over the regulations from last year, which I believe was five fish per person for the party, char for the party charter fleet and then three fish per person for the private fleet. Um, the issue though, and John, uh, correct me on this, I think the projection is that those regulations are gonna have over a 70% chance of um, exceeding the allowable catch limit, which is a big problem because if we do exceed the allowable catch limit, we may have way stricter regulations um, further down the line. That's a result of, again, the federal law. So we're kind of in a weird spot for 2021 um, in terms of you know what's gonna happen with harvest for bluefish. I think a lot of people are kind of holding their breath to see what happens. Um, at the same time, there's a much kind of larger program around rebuilding the stock that's going to be happening throughout this year. Um, and when that amendment is complete, the rebuilding program, I think is going to be between four and seven years and folks public input is going to be really important for, for kind of, you know, advocating for what we think should be as quick a rebuilding timeline as possible. John, do you want to uh, say something about uh, Albi and tuna? Um, well, just a quick comment on the bluefish thing, because, mm. you know, not, not many people kill them in the first place. And then the fishing mortality is coming from a pretty small part of the fishing public. Um, and, and also coming from discards, the, the discard rate for, uh, or discard mortality rate for bluefish is 15%. Um, so, you know, if there's a, there's a big overage and I suspect there will be because um, one of the things Willie didn't mention is that instead of basing their projections on, on a three-year average like they usually do. They base it on, on 2018, which was the one year that bluefish didn't show up anywhere. Um, and so, you know, they avoided even harsher measures than we have now by, by going with that one year, not going to the three-year average. But the risk is that there's probably going to be a massive overage, particularly since a lot of bluefish showed up, uh, certainly more than 2018 in the last two years. Um, so we, we may very well be looking at, at you know, seasonal closure, uh, catch and release closures, even no, no targeting regulations. I don't know how they would uh, enforce that, but it is something right. that's entirely possible. In fact, likely, um, which would certainly affect our industry. Um, but what was your, your question was about Albies and tuna? Um, well, I think people it's, you know, uh, there was a question about tuna. Can we briefly touch on the state of those stocks? Yeah, we can. Um, let Willie do it. I'm give you the anecdotal version. <laughs> I'm going to let Willie cover the science part because Willie did a lot of his his graduate work on on bluefin tuna. He's one of the the, the experts uh, on the East Coast uh, on bluefin tuna. Um, but but uh, anecdotally, uh, most guys in the industry and and recreational fishermen will agree that the stock has been going up and up and up every year. There's more of them. Uh, they become more available to anglers. Uh, and I'm not just talking about one or two year classes. There seems to be a pretty good age and size distribution. Um, and, and I, frankly, I built a big portion of my business uh, on that availability. And I think to some extent, the science bears that out. Since about 2009 or 2010, I have the chart somewhere. I could probably put it up. There's a pretty been a pretty big increase uh, of, of bluefin abundance, not just on the water but on paper. Bluefin are very nuanced because we don't know for sure whether or not these are Eastern Atlantic fish or Western Atlantic fish, whether they're coming over from Europe or whether they're coming mm -hmm. from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the current science, if I understand it correctly, is that we had a couple of real good year classes that we pretty much fished out and, and the new science is not indicating um, an abundance of fish behind that. Um, and, and why it's not indicating that, I'm not sure because certainly I'm seeing it on the water and, and, and it may be an Eastern Atlantic fish, um, but there's probably gonna be some constraining measures in the near future, uh, which is fine on my end. I don't mind, one fish 
per boat is enough for the entire crew. Everybody takes a picture with it. And then you play catch and release after that. I'm, I'm fine with it. And I think most folks in the industry are fine with it. So if we have to uh, have those regulations and so be it. And, and frankly, the unders, uh, the fish that we're allowed to kill that are under 47 inches, I hate killing those things anyway. There's no reason to kill them. Uh, it's stupid to kill them. I mean, we shouldn't be allowed to keep them. Mm -hmm. And, and that may not be in line with the rest of the industry, but it's, it's the truth. Anyway, Willie, you want to talk about the science? I mean, I'm, I, it's, as you said, it's kind of a thicket. Um, there's a lot going on here in terms of uncertainty around mixing, you know, whether our fish are coming from the Eastern Atlantic or the Western Atlantic. Um, one thing that had a lot of scrutiny this year was what we call the indices of abundance. So what are kind of your baseline uh, values of how many fish there are in the water to kind of, you know, run your stock assessment models and that sort of thing. Um, one of the major ones on the, uh, for small fish here in the Western Atlantic is actually the recreational fishery, uh, which is pretty interesting. So our, you know, what, what our folks are catching is, is used to understand how many small fish are. Cause you know, as John said, um, you know, a lot of our fish are, you know, 47 to 50 inches or, you know, in that area and, and Western bluefin don't mature until, until age nine, which is, you know, in, I think closer to 80 inches or so. So, um, you know, these are juvenile fish that we catch. Um, and so one thing, again, there was kind of a disconnect between um, what those data were showing in terms of how many small fish there were, which was a lot of small fish and what people were seeing on the water, which is a lot of small fish and what the stock assessment is saying. Um, and what I wanna make clear is that I, to my understanding, and again, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes here, what the stock assessment, the way the bluefin are managed is they're looking into the near future of the fishery. And while folks like John and recreational anglers target these small fish, most of our fishery in both the US and Canada in the, um, in the Western Atlantic is for big fish over 73 inches, those, those big adult fish, the giant bluefin. And basically there aren't gonna be, according to the data that we have, there are not gonna be as many of those big fish in the next couple of years. So that is one of the reasons why um, there's been recommended a reduction in the catch limit. Now, if you talk to commercial folks, harpooners and stuff, they'll say there are tons of, you know, 50 to 65 inch fish that are offshore and they're out of range of the recreational industry. Um, and that's not an invalid point. You know, there, there are issues with having fishery dependent indices of abundance. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of them. And so, you know, fishermen are, you know, understandably like there's a, there's a disconnect and folks are upset about it. You know, scientists are listening. There's been conversation around what the indices need to be. There's also an understanding of the need to, you know, get our recreational data improved. So we actually have a project trying to do that. Um, but the bottom line is the recommendation was to reduce catch because there weren't projected to be as many big fish coming up. Um, my understanding, and this is a weird year because of ICAT, uh, sorry, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, which is a treaty organization of 52 nations that typically has a 10 day meeting in November. It was canceled this year because of COVID. And so they've been doing this all over email over the past several months. Um, they're pretty close to setting regulations for this coming year. Um, John, last I heard, I'm pretty sure there's actually not going to be a reduction this year um, in spite of the science. And basically, again, that was because of a lot of pushback from basically what we're talking about right now. Um, and I think the compromise is going to be to have an updated assessment of the stock in 2021. Um, so I know this was a lot, uh, there's a lot going on with the species. There's more science happening all the time to better understand the relative contributions of the East and the West. Um, and so we'll be looking forward to kind of seeing how that evolves um, here pretty soon. Um, there are a couple of other, we, we could go on forever and ever and ever, but I think we'll probably take maybe three more topics. Um, one of them has to do with bait fish. Um, you know, there's a question here about mackerel, another question about Manhattan. You know, I think anybody who is out anywhere off the, you know, Montauk or uh, sort of the south, south side of Long Island or anywhere near the New York Bight has seen for the past several years, just like acres and acres and acres of bunker. I mean, you know, bunker you could walk on. What does that say? And I'm not sure whether it's, it's you, Willie, or you, Tony, or, or John. Tony, go ahead. What, what, what is the yeah. state of the bait and, and, the, and the mackerel that are moving into the Montauk area? What, what, what are the... What are, the I'll let, existence I'll let of, John, of those fish and those numbers telling us. Yeah, I'll, I'll let John take the mackerel because that's pretty localized. But, you know, collectively, I think between me and John, we've been working on Menhaden for like 50 years. If you combine the two of us, it's kind of, yeah. it's ridiculous. So uh, 
uh, actually a couple of months ago, we were able to pass something called ecological uh, ecosystem based uh, ecological based reference points. Um, and what what that did was it forces managers to look at the significance of Menhaden for the overall ecosystem rather than just a single species for harvest. Now, it didn't change the quota. It didn't, you know, it, they're just basing it on a limited number of predators right now, the model, and it has to be tweaked. But the fact of the matter is this is the first time uh, any fish has been attempted to be managed in this way. So that's huge. It's wonderful to hear. It, it, it makes my heart happy to hear that you guys are seeing so many menhaden. I live in an area on the Chesapeake Bay that's just north of the reduction fleet in Reedville. And um, I am not experiencing the same numbers in menhaden as you are. When you remove 400 or so million fish out of a relatively small area, um, you don't see as many of them. I know that's crazy. Uh, to think that, but we're not having the same, we're not, we're not seeing the same stuff. I know with John, just what he does with tuna and the, and the bait aggregations and what that means to the overall life. Um, it's pretty significant. And I just want to say one last thing before I hand it over to him. Um, you know, there is no, there is no straight line that says, if there's this many menhaden, there's this many striped bass. We don't have that yet. And you can't really suggest that, you know, if we had more, if we had more menhaden, there'd be this many striped bass. We, we heard that or, or vice or vice versa. Yeah. We've heard that argument a lot and it's, it's not there yet. And, uh, and unfortunately what John brought up with striped bass management earlier is there's some suggestion that, the Chesapeake Bay is losing its holding capacity and can't produce as many striped bass. There's no science that proves that either. But this argument that a lack of menhaden means there's the, that kind of feeds into it actually feeds into the bad argument and kind of helps them out a little bit. I know I would love it if I never heard it again. Um, but yeah, there's no direct correlation. It's great to hear you guys have a lot of menhaden. We're still kind of stuck behind the eighth ball but we did get a new management uh, management scheme passed and we're really hopeful for the future. John, what, what about the macro, buddy? Wait, I want to talk <laughs> over, I'll, John called me a weenie, so I need to talk over him real quick. Um, yeah, go just for it. One, one, other, <laughs> one other point, just to put in black and white what Tony was saying, the reason that, the reason that striped bass are overfished right now is because we, cut, we overfished them. It's because we caught too many of them. It has nothing to do with Menhaden. So right. just, you know, that's kind of the other side of the coin, right? When it comes to what the accountability is here, the overfished problem is a overfished problem. It's not anything else. Yeah. And, and I was going to say the same thing. There's a lot of folks that are saying, well, address Menhaden and you'll rebuild striped bass. It's, 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 any, uh, it's something that we have to address, we have to address overfishing. It's not, it's not something these bass are magically going to appear out of the water if we have significant Menhaden uh, concentrations. But, uh, you know, the, their localized depletion is real, um, absolutely, in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, however, when you do a significant reduction, like we did in 2012, 20% reduction, and you have this sort of uh, fast-lived or, or uh, fast-growing short-lived fish, it, it doesn't take much. You reduce harvest on them a little bit, and, and they come back in spades. I mean, holy crap, like this 20% reduction in 2012, we have fish all the way up in Maine. That hasn't happened in a hundred years. And that's the first real reduction on, on the Menhaden fishery that, that the commission ever did. It was more or less not managed before that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure what's going on with mackerel. And frankly, I haven't heard much about it. We had some where we are and it's, you know, I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen that in probably 15 years, um, but I don't. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with mackerel, and maybe, maybe Willie can address that. Um, I'm, I'm, there's a question here about uh, the Canadians, my, my compatriots, and and what they may not be doing 
uh, for the striped bass fishery, the suggestion that uh, up north, you know, where they care a lot about salmon, where at least from a recreational standpoint, salmon is the highest value fish. Um, there's an encouragement to, to catch and keep stripers because salmon fishermen believe that they're playing a role, the striped bass are playing a role in depleting the salmon fishery. Uh, Willie, Tony, John, do you know anything about that? And is there, is there a dialogue between the Americans and Canadians on the management of the striped bass stock? So I'm gonna jump in first, and then I think Tony's actually been speaking with folks in Canada about this. So I'll this let is him... this is so silly because I've just started a conversation with a bunch of folks from Nova Scotia about this. It's like a week ago. This is great. Will you go? Yeah. So I just wanted to say, you know, first off, you know, John mentioned that the lion's share of um of our of our fish in the in the Northeast come from Chesapeake Bay as well as the Hudson River. There are actually, I think, six genetically distinct stocks of striped bass up and down the coast, and three of those are in Canada. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions about the extent to which those fish from those, those you know, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and, and the rivers in, in that area actually come down and intermix with our fish down here. So just wanted to flag that, like, it's still kind of an open question, to my mm -hmm. understanding, as to, like, whether, you know, the fish that are being interacted with up in, you know, the salmon streams up there are um, are relevant to us, you know, because I think you know, obviously you think about species, but fishery scientists we think about stocks, right? So you know, mm -hmm. you, you manage the different stocks, and in some cases, like with striped bass and you know the Hudson and Chesapeake fish, they overlap, and you might catch one here, one there. But with those Canadian fish, it's not quite clear how many of those fish come into our waters. But Tony, go ahead. I, what I've learned is pretty fascinating. They have. Um several different stocks up in Nova Scotia and one of them the fish winter in a lake another one the fish winter in the Bay of Fundy so you know there's there's striped bass all the way down to Florida I actually caught one fishing for speckled trout in Venice a couple of years ago like they're they're pretty resilient fish but they behave differently so you know our coastal stock is let's say like North Carolina to Maine yeah, there's a little bit of mixing that occurs in Nova Scotia, um, but the fish in Nova Scotia kind of behave almost like the fish in North Carolina or the fish in, it, believe it or not, it's a state fish of South Carolina. So they, like South Carolina fish, where it's almost like a river system fish or a small estuary fish. And they behave the, way, the same way in like the Roanoke River system. They behave the same way in the Clinch River, where my, my two nephews are at UT Knoxville. And, uh, and they're catching stripers in the Clinch River. So it's an incredible fish. There's not a ton of mixing that goes on, but I, I do believe that like Willie mentioned the genetic studies, I think there was a lot of collaboration between mass DMF and it was at Acadia, Willie? Acadia University up in Nova Scotia? Or? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, there is collaboration, but I think what you'll find here is, is there's not enough collaboration between the states and NOAA on, on some issues. And there's, there's certainly not a, it, so it's kind of broken all the way around. But yeah, we do talk to our friends in Canada and, uh, and it's fascinating. Their fisheries are absolutely fascinating. Uh, lots to learn. Um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna raise two more questions and then I think we should probably, I'm sorry, John, did you wanna say something? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Uh, one was about seals, and, and I also got a similar question about sharks. Um, is there any sense, I mean, Willie, maybe you, you have some data on this, or is there any sense that, that the, the, the increase or the, the apparent increase in the seal population is in part responsible for the state of the striper stock? Great question. Um, definitely a loaded one. Um, I think the shark one as well. Um, and this, you know, the, these things come up when you have one species that's, that's protected and one species that isn't protected. Um, certainly, you know, uh, there is anecdotal evidence, as we say it, there are, you know, there are interactions here. Um, you know, I know some guys who when they see seals, they immediately, you know, go as far away as they can. Um, I know this year, a lot of folks on Cape Cod were blaming seals for lack of striped bass around Cape Cod. Well, there were a lot of fish um, you know, north toward Cape Ann and, and Gloucester, where coincidentally, there are also a lot of Menhaden. Um, there is no kind of scientific evidence that I'm aware of um, that's linking seal recovery to striped bass, you know, uh, to reduction in striped bass numbers. It's also worth noting that, to my understanding, uh, at least in the Gulf of Maine, like seal population structure is very diffuse. Like you can't, you know, kind of the next step where this goes, where I've heard it go is like, you know, seal control, seal culling, which is obviously like, again, 
a total Marine Mail Protection Act thicket, not something we're going to get into here. But, um, you know, my understanding is that it's one totally kind of um, homogenous population of seals. So, you know, even if you remove seals from one area, it would be pretty readily repopulated from other areas. So um, that was a long, a, a long version of a short answer, which is there's not any kind of hard evidence on any stock wide uh, impacts. All right, and here's the last one for you guys. Is there anything along the lines of an app to collect data on, um, at the very least, recreational catches? Is it something that ASCA has considered? Is it something that you would raise money to fund? Is, is it the kind of thing that you could get guides at the very least to participate on, even if you couldn't get um, you know, Joe Sixpack at the marina to join in on? Tony, you're smiling. I'm going to give yeah, this I'm, one to you. I'm to start. smiling because Willie's currently doing science on, on this on bluefin tuna, um, and I, and I think he would probably like to talk about uh, the apps. John, you had I saw you going to go like this with the with the bass. Did you? Did we leave you out? I know you get upset. Um, well, I, I did want to give my no bullshit response to the seal thing because I. You know, I, I think Willie's answer. By, by the way, John, I'm sorry if I missed a facial expression. No, 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 it, it's okay. I, 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 I'll, you, I'll be you were very covered quick. Briefly by the Q and A. <laughs> I'll, I'll be very, very quick. Um, so, seals and sharks and striped bass all coexisted well before us filthy Europeans got here, and they. Were, <laughs> and it, it annoys me when people try to blame other things on striped bass decline. It's our fault. We're killing too many of them. It's not the freaking seals. It's not the sharks. It's us. So, I mean, we got to stop with that because it, it just look like dummies. Um, we can't blame it on, on things that are natural. And, and all that is figured into the natural mortality rate and the stock assessments and the stock assessment updates anyway. Uh, and we control the things that we can control. We don't bother with things that we can't. So that's it. Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Um, so before I get in, and I'll be very quick. Before I get into the recreational data, just want to mention to the uh, to the Canada question. I'm just putting in the chat right now, um, taking my ASJ hat off for one second. Um, I contribute a monthly fishery science column to All in the Water magazine, um, just as a fishery scientist, not as a, a recreational fisheries advocate. And I uh, did a story last summer on some of the science that's been going on with genetic work. So I just wanted to put that in the chat for folks. Um, when it comes to recreational data. Um, again, millions of people, millions of trips, tons of information. Um, you know, NOAA's Marine Recreational Information Program does the best it can. Um, and, you know, obviously, the more you aggregate data across the entire coast, um, the, you know, the, the, the more your kind of error is reduced. Um, that being said, there are a ton of these kinds of apps that are out there right now. There's stuff circulating for every fishery, every sector. Um, and that's great, but the challenge is making that meaningful from a scientific and management perspective, um, which is a lot harder to do than it sounds uh, in terms of validating the data, in terms of, you know, having some kind of design that, uh, that, that makes it, you know, that you can extrapolate to the rest of the population. There are a lot of challenges with it, um, with the, you know, with the apps, and there have been several in Florida. Um, in addition to the validation, there's what has been known as attrition. So, you know, people, they love the thing for like three months and they right. stop using it. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we'd have a census estimate of every fish that every person ever caught. We're never going to get there. And so we're always looking at kind of what's the next best solution. Just to give a sense of kind of where we are right now, um, the bluefin tuna fishery requires all recreational anglers to report harvest within 24 hours. Requires, it's not voluntary. It's not out of the goodness of anybody's heart. Um, estimated compliance is around 20%. And that's one of like two examples of a required self-reporting situation for um, for anglers in the in in the Atlantic and the Gulf. So we with have a long way to go. Associated with it, right, Willie? There are penalties, but yeah. it's one you know, and it's uh. So where we are right now is we're starting small. We're looking at a pilot study in Massachusetts focusing on this bluefin tuna fishery, and the basic premise is, you know, what are the incentives? What's the carrot and the stick? How do we get people to actually use this thing? And the hope is that yeah. by identifying kind of what those incentives are, what those fears might be that might get people to use them, we can then kind of generalize those lessons learned across other fisheries. But, you know, it's definitely something that managers have been thinking a lot about. There's been limited success in some fisheries. Um, it's where we need to go. 
you know, one thing that you will hear all three of us talk about all the time is the need for recreational accountability. And whatever your thoughts in the commercial sector, by and large, they are far more accountable for the fish that they catch than the recreational sector is. Part of that is just a function of how many, how many recreational fishermen there are, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there's a huge impact coming from this side um, that needs to be better understood. So that's kind of an area that we're trying to, trying to expand in. Well, seeing as we've crossed uh, the 930 threshold, uh, I, I think we will call it a night. Um, I'm going to give it back to David and Lou Yen to close things out, but I, I wanted to say thank you to John, Tony, and Willie for what I think was a, a fantastic a kickoff to the Masters of the Fly series. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, a huge thank you, uh, Eric, for your, your masterful moderation, and thanks to John and, and Willie and Tony. I mean, obviously, it sounds like we could do this uh, every month for a couple hours and still not answer everyone's questions. So we will definitely- Yes, apologies. Apologies to the questions that didn't get fully articulated or fully answered. Uh, Cer there will be not, another opportunity. Certainly not for lack of great moderation. And, and so we will definitely have to schedule a, uh, you know, episode two of this. And thank you for, you know, we have- you know, half the audience has stayed on well past uh, the ending, uh, the, the, the listed ending time. So thank you all. Obviously, this is a topic of, of great passion for everyone uh, and really appreciate everyone being here. Again, huge thanks to Tom for running the, running the, the, the back of house and to the whole Masters of the Fly um, uh, team. So uh, David, anything else you want to take us out with? Uh, you're on mute, my friend. Uh, don't forget mastersoffly.com. You can find all our content on Masters of the Fly on YouTube. So when you want to review and hear some things and answer some additional questions, you can do that. And we look forward to seeing everybody um, at our next date, which is, wait, I can't even read it on February my- February 15th, uh, President's go. Day. It's a Monday. So uh, eight o'clock President's Day. Jamie Howard, Howard Films. Uh, we'll be watching a couple of really great clips from his films, and and uh, I, you know, having an incredible conversation with him about he, how he made uh, really some of the most iconic fly fishing movies of all time, or fishing movies of all time. Yep. But again, a huge Thank thanks you. to our Aska friends and to Eric tonight. Thank you, everybody. Have and a great. Thanks time. to everyone for all the engagement, all the great questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So maybe to the pan and, and again to the panel. I know uh, folks are the attendees are dropping off, but thank you guys. That was really terrific. And just uh, every time I'm with you folks, I feel like uh, I you know when I'm when we start the conversation that I know all the answers and then I realize I don't even know the questions so you guys are incredible so thank you so much for everything and Eric an incredible job tonight really really thank you so much it. I had three great panelists who made it easy <laughs> Eric that was pretty awesome man you're a talented guy I was laughing my I've done a lot of these I've never I've never had a moderator like you I'll tell you that much man you're great you know, I was texting Lou Yen I'm like damn your friend's smooth <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you all. I know it's late on a school night, uh, so uh, we'll let you all off the hook. But again, thanks a lot for everything. And this was a great, great conversation. Again, right. Tom. Thank you, guys. See you all soon. Awesome technical director, Tom. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. That was awesome. Cool. Well done. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. See you guys. Bye.